Hello. Um, it's good to be here, and it's good to be sharing some of this work with you and talking a bit about these films and this practice and a little bit about myself and how these things came to be. Um, but thank you for having me tonight, and thank you for the invitation to um, not only show Cloudless Blue Years of Summer, but also Mothney Towards the Ocean, Towards the Shore, uh, my first feature-length film. Um, you know, like I, I try to think about where, where this film started, and it started in so many different places. Uh, the first of which is around my experiences teaching and learning Chinook Wawa, uh, in Portland, Oregon, when I was living there in 2000, um, I think I started in 2010, 2011, learning Chinook and starting to teach it. And it was through that that I also started making films. I started around the same time. I started, I think a little bit earlier, um, making a documentary about my friends building a fishing scaffold on the Columbia River. And through that, I feel that my filmmaking practice and my language teaching practice are very much entwined and Chinook Wawa has been there since the beginning and um, it was really nice to find ways to incorporate that in my in my work and to think about how I don't know how to present indigenous language in different ways or new ways or ways that feel relevant to myself or to my friends or to my communities and one of the first films that I had made was in 2013. Um, it was my first and only short narrative film and it was called Hui Hui. And in it, my friend Jordan and I um, acted in it and we wrote the script and it was all in Chinook Wawa and we were both speaking to Chinook Wawa to each other. And that was to show the language in a, in a sort of unspectacular way or rather to show the utility of language or to show language being used in an everyday setting and it just to feel normal, you know? and through that process, I started thinking more about what the possibilities of cinema are with indigenous language revitalization and indigenous presence, and even how to tell stories from a lens specific or particular to my own community or my own upbringing or my own family's way of moving through the world. Um, and over the years, I've made a number of short films that primarily are experimental, that's touch on different facets of indigeneity and of language and of homeland and of presence and resisting erasure and dealing with and responding to what comes next after the acknowledgement of traumas and atrocities. And that's really important to me as well because there's a lot of different ways that I feel um, my identity is framed or <laughs> my identity has been, um, I don't know, been told to feel certain ways about myself growing up, you know, as a native person. Um, growing up in rural parts of Washington State and then living in Southern California and even just trying to come to recognize or to reconcile these different ideas of homelands. Um, I was born in Washington State in 1984 and um, when I was born, I, I, my family lived in, um, uh, next to a reservation called Lummi. We live in Ferndale, Washington and I'm not Lummi, my tribes are Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin and Pechanga from Southern California. Um, so I was very much living not in my ancestral homelands, but a lot of my cousins are Lummi, a lot of my families are Lummi. So it was, it was just important to be part of the community, but also um, I think taught from an early age that there's these different boundaries and there's these different roles that people play as guests, as tribal members, as visitors. And that really shaped my perspective on how I moved to these different locations from Washington State to Southern California, to Portland, Oregon, and ultimately to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is where my tribe's from. And um, through that process, I, I start thinking more about land and landscape and language. And the films that I've been making for the past seven years, I don't know, necess not necessarily try to like map out or to um, try and <laughs> teacher understands what these different roles are, what these different perspectives are, but rather help elucidate so these different ways that they can be internalized or these different feelings that one can have in these different spaces and how even one looks at a different aspect of, of history. And um, there were a few short films, like I mentioned, that that also involved Chinook Wawa outside of that first one, Hui Hui, where um, we're trading a fish. Hui Hui is um, Chinook Wawa for trade. It actually means hand, so it's like hand to hand. Um, and a few years later, I had made another short film 
well, actually it wasn't even a year later, it was maybe six months later. I made a short film called Wawa, which is about my language teacher and my language teacher's teacher and his teacher's teacher's teacher. And just the way of acknowledging how important it is to, I don't know, like know who taught your teacher or know where the language that you speak comes from. Like specifically, whether it's what family, what region, what dialect they're speaking, these are things that you learn and these are things that you teach your students and these are things that I taught my students. And it was just really a, a film about looking at these traditions and looking at this history and this lineage, as well as looking at the difficulties in translation and the difficulties in thinking <laughs> or not thinking in your English brain and trying to think in your Chinook brain or your the, the brain of your target language and having that grow and having that flourish and not be a filter for what you're for your thoughts or to not have English be a filter for your thoughts because a, a common problem when you're learning your first second language is that you want to think in English and then translate in your head and produce like the language in Chinook or, or Spanish or Ho-Chunk or Pachunga or whatever. Um, so it's just kind of trying to think in the language as soon as you can. And this, the film is about that in, in many ways in lineage and tradition. Um, and a few years later, the, the clip that I'm going to show you um, uh, from is, uh, is a film I made called Anti-Objects or Space Without Path or Boundary. And that was a film that, um, I don't know, like I started thinking more about location or landscape or these different places in these different landscapes and architecture. And there was an architect that, whose essay I read called Anti-Objects and his name is Ken Gokuma. And in it, he proposes the anti-objects, or he, pre he states that an, that an architectural object is one that sits outside of the environment that it is in, um, that it very much is like not made from the same materials. It's very like closed off and unnatural in terms of everything around it, like very, <laughs> very reductively. Um, and I started thinking about these different locations in Portland in similar sort of ways as, as in these structures as objects or anti-objects. And in the film, I visit three locations. The first one is uh, Tillicum Crossing Bridge, which is the, one, the newest bridge in Portland at the time. And it's named after Chinook, uh, Chinookan word, Tillicum, it's, it's family or friends or people. And thinking about, well, what does it mean to name an object, a structure um, in the city after uh, an indigenous word, after Chinook word, you know, is it an actual form of acknowledgement? Is it actually being utilized in a way that incorporates or acknowledges indigenous people in this region? Or does it, is it just some sort of lip service? Like, I don't know, but that was one of the things I was thinking about <clears throat> as I moved my camera across this bridge. The second location was um, the Castle Poodle Plank House, which is um, just upriver on the Columbia River in Ridgefield, Washington. And it's a replica plank house um, built by the Chinookan, or so it's a plank house built on the site of a Chinookan village that isn't there anymore. And it's a, it's a plank house that's utilized by the Chinook Nation in Washington, and um, it's maintained on wildlife refuge land. So it's also maintained by the state. And so it's just a strange sort of um, practice or place where it's open to the public in some instances, but when the tribe's using it, it's closed to the public for only their purposes. And I'm really interested in that, that tension or just those different boundaries and ideas of place and placements. The third location is the Grand Round Reservation um, in Grand Round, Oregon. And in it, my friend Greg and I, we went there and um, I don't know, we were just like walking around and stuff <laughs> and in my camera. And you know, just thinking about the the reservation as a constructed place. Um, it's like simultaneously like an object, but also it's an anti-object, and it's a place that exists um, <clears throat> in similar sort of ways as um, um, in similar sort of ways as 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 this idea of of constructed nature or savagery or the wild or the wilderness. And it's just like the way that those three different places triangulated. I mean, I don't think they offer, they, they're generative in ways of thinking about how to move through space. And the final um, thing that brings it all together for me is these recordings that I, um, that I got access to from, my, from one of my Chinook teachers, Henry Zank. And these are recordings that he made of him and Wilson Bob, um, who taught him the language, who was a fluent speaker, uh, is in 1983. And Wilson was in his mid 80s at the time. And after Wilson passed away, Henry by default became the, the one of the last fluent speakers of the language. 
uh, and he's a, a white guy from from Berkeley, and um, he's done a lot of work in the last thirty years to help and su support the tribe with their language curriculum and like designing all these different. He made the dictionary, you know. I mean, I think everyone everyone knows Henry. We call him Chup Henry, which is Grandpa Henry, and he's just an important part of the community. And listening to these recordings, it was really nice to hear my teacher's teacher learn the language and to see him learning these things that I, I remember being taught. So I'm going to show a little clip from this film, maybe five minutes or so. Um, let's see. All right. Okay, hopefully this works. Okay, they started out. One's all hung up with flowers, I guess. Kara ukmanus, kagapus wik fush. Kara masiakus, inatai tunus. Yeah. Kara malati, la. Somebody had it crooked. Kara malapush. Kara malapush. Kagapus kaiwa. Kagapus kaiwa. Ala mahihi. Now you're laughing. Nanchnaiga. Look at me. Wik hayu mu kaiwa masiakus. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, here's what explains the whole game here. Alachtipus uktunas fuchman yahihi. Maybe this little girl laughed. All right, sorry about that. This is a little mix up with the screen share. I'll play it from the beginning. So you can all see the text on the screen that's red. Okay, great. Now we'll play it. Okay, they started out. One's all hung up with flowers, I guess. Kara ukmanus, kagapus wik fush. Kara masiakus, inatai tunus. Kara malati, la. Somebody had it crooked. Kara malapush. Kara malapush. Kagapus kaiwa. Kagapus kaiwa. Ala mahihi. Now you're laughing. Nanchnaiga. Look at me. Wik hayu mu kaiwa masiakus. Wik hayu kaiwa kaiwa masiakus. Okay, here's what explains the whole game here. Alachtipus uk dunas fuchman yahihi. Maybe this little girl laugh. Uk ich yachga uk hayu wawa. The one that's talking. Ha wik ya ko kabayaka. Ah, what ya? He got there yet? All the yahihi. Now he's laughing. All the natulu maiga. Now I got you beat. Yeah. You want to eat eggs with me or not? Did you bring your lunch or what? Oh, I got a lunch, but so I don't really need to, I guess. Huh? I brought a lunch, so I guess I don't really need to take any of your eggs. Two of you should be plenty. How about bacon? Is there a word for bacon? Kusha. Kusha. Bacon would be pig. Kusha. 
<laughs> Who should we get for? Oh, yeah, that's it. How yeah. many, how many, um, country are you? See, yeah, uh, three, that's plenty. Phone? <laughs> yeah. God, you're getting there better than I am. No, I can't. <laughs> I can't. I, all I know is words. I can't put it together very well. Let's see, I'll put it back in there. Which one? I'll put that oh. back in there. Oh. Michael, the sock costs. Who should we get for? Yeah, now you're better than I am. I gotta figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> testing, testing, testing. Hello. Um, that is a clip from Anti Objects or Space Without Path or Boundary. Uh, it was a film from 2017, and it's about 13 minutes total. Um, and yeah, it touches on a lot of things that I think were starting to lead me away from thinking about more experimental ethnography or anthropology or experimental documentary, and thinking more about these histories and the more human relationship between uh, artifacts. And one of these, the things that, I mean, if looking at the these different locations was whether it's the reservation the plank house or this bridge um, through the lens of and questioning how they can be objects or anti-objects i'm also looking at these recordings as well where um how i think henry gave me like 25 hours of them and the things that i liked most about them were just these small little interludes where you could hear wilson and henry talking and visiting and laughing and joking and teasing each other like those sorts of relationships did so much more for me in giving a deeper understanding of the language and its life and how it's used and how it's used to communicate. And, you know, just like hearing Wilson and Henry talking about eggs, you know, and, and what the word for bacon is. And I don't know, just the laughter. Um, it's, it's like, how can I then relate to these objects or these recordings, not as objects, but ne neither as artifacts um, but as just markers of friendship and how can I participate in that friendship or this relationship in a way that transcends time. Um, and so uh, that was like one thing that re really struck me while making this film was just the relationship that I have to these materials and also had to start looking at archival objects and, and things that are in museums that were stolen um, as also having life and also having a place um, and their utility in our lives today and to think about utility, usage, and I don't know, I think just life. Um, in the film, there's my friend Greg Archuleta, um, who works for the, um, the, the, the Confederate Traps of Grand Rounds. Um, he does a lot of um, crafts work and uh, carving and language work. He's a really wonderful human being. And in the film also is Sweetwater Sami, who appears in Mafni. Um, I didn't even realize it until after I started shooting um, uh, Mafni that uh, Sweetwater was also in this film. Um, but both, it, they both happened around the same sort of way where um, I would come to Portland, to, I was came to Portland to shoot and Sweetwater was in town and we, we just like hang out whenever, you know, I'm passing through and um, I was going to do some shooting for the bridge and she wanted to come and so she ended up in some shots and um, she was cool with being in the film, um, even just in terms of indigen indigenous presence in these structures. And same thing with Mothney as well, I was, I came to Portland to do some test shootage test um, shooting and um, yeah, I was just driving around and she wanted to come too. And so we just hung out and um, she um, appeared in some of the test footage and just found its way into the film. And I think that also shows like how I am interested in collaborating with people or how 
I don't know, I like, make, I like to make films with friends. I like to make films with people that I trust and who also trust me because that's really important, especially in terms of representation and the power of the camera and the power of these different apparatuses and how they're utilized to either give information or hide information or, or I don't know, present this idea that you're, you and audience members learning something about being an indigenous person. Um, and it's these relationships that I'm interested in and that I think a lot about. Um, I'm going to show you two more clips, both leading up to Mothni in terms of how I'm thinking about myth and um, nonfiction film just beyond, like, yeah, the more experimental slant, slants of documentary. Um, the next clip I'm going to show is from a film that I made in 2018, 19, 18, it was 18, um, called Fainting Spells. Um, this is a film that first came about when I was reading this Ho-Chunk ethnobotany text called, I mean, it was Ho-Chunk ethnobotany. And through that, I just, I, I came across this plant that my tribe used to revive people that have fainted. It's called a Hoiska. It's also known as the Indian pipe plants. And I never seen them before, heard of it before, but reading the description and how it was used and just learning about it, it just, it just stuck with me for a long time. And through mulling over this this plant and its usage, you just started to think about, is there a myth for this? Is there a story for this? And so I tried to do some research, but couldn't find anything. And I thought about, well, if what if there was, you know, what would it sound like? And then I started to think about who, who would have made the myth? How are they feeling? Um, were they upset? Are they going through a breakup? Are they happy? You know, like what is the actual human elements to the creation of myth or just to receive myths or to tell myths and to not again, think of them as archival objects, because that is something that happened and has happened, at least the way that we as indigenous people are told or taught to view our own culture and our own histories. Once a myth was written in a book by an anthropologist in 1915, and it just kind of stops. It's like, it's not changed anymore. It doesn't grow. It doesn't change with, the, with every person that tells the story a little differently. You know, It's just, it, it becomes static in a certain sort of way. It's not entirely true. Like, I mean, there are definitely active storytellers still out there now that, you know, participate and 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 tell these myths and probably making myths. And I just started thinking about how it's also like an act or a gesture of presence and a continued health of a community to continue to make stories. And so I made up a myth for this plant it's called the Hoiska. And um you know, it's told in three parts, and I think you'll see it once once you um, once I start playing it. Actually, funny enough, the clip that I queued up, I didn't realize it has Jordan Mercier in it, who also appeared in Lost Me. So maybe you're starting to see a pattern. Um, but this is a clip from Antioch or from Fainting Spells. It's about I don't know, five minutes, maybe. Um, again, please let me know if um, there's any malfunctions. Oops.
That's Fainting Spells. Um, like I mentioned, um, that's Jordan Mercier, who appears in um, uh, Machne, uh, walking through that controlled burn on ground rounds. Um, yeah, and the film definitely was like preparing me or to, or it was one of the places that I was starting to play around with these different ideas of myth and storytelling and how myths exist and how they are alongside of us. And Mahni really became the, the culmination, not the culmination, because then it means that there's not going to be any more. Um, but it became part of, or just like the next step in this process that I was interested in taking, not only with my work visually, but also in terms of playing with narrative, playing with documentary, playing with nonfiction, and how, I don't know, how, how a portrait of two people as they move through the world with this myth being the thing that they circle around that myth being the origin of death myth, which um, Mahni is, is, is built around and how it can function in a way that's, I don't know, shows these different sides of, of being indigenous without being too prescriptive or um, that allows for more interpretation or just a little bit more, more poetics in terms of understanding how the cinematic form can function in ways outside of being purely educational, um, which I feel that a lot of uh, audiences expect from indigenous work or from films focused on Native Americans or American Indians or indigenous people or First Nations people, that there's this expectation that they're going to learn something or they're going to be moved in some sort of way. And these are comments that I've heard from people who have expressed disappointed, disappointment in my work that I didn't teach them anything. Um, and I don't know, I just tell them it's not my job. And 
I think that a lot of the way that the work functions too is thinking about who my audience is and how it is for a very specific audience and it's for um, a group of people that I think about how do I not have to contextualize or how do I not have to explain or you know have five title cards in the beginning full of text that gives you a history lesson you know it's like no I just want to make work that explores these different ideas and kind of picks up where we left off um, I don't know, just like, you know, those friends that you have that you see every two or three months or talk to every two and three months like now, and so you can just pick up where you left off and you don't need to like rehash too much. And like, I think that's the relationship that I feel like I have with my audience or how I think about my audience in a certain sort of way. That's whether or not they're, they're up to speed on what's going on or what these things are I'm trying to say, um, they're a continuation of questions around indigeneity, around presence and around agency and storytelling and telling these stories and how to move through these different medias and these different screens and with the, the users of cameras and how to have a sense of autonomy um, while, while either what you're filming or what you're making or, or whatever stories you're trying to tell. I think that was about another five to seven minutes. Um, I'm not quite sure what else. I mean, I can talk about many, bunch of stuff, um, but I think it'd be, yeah, good time for everybody to help guide me. Yeah, so that was a really fantastic introduction to your work. So um, maybe Sh Shana, do you want to hop on too? And we can, we can lead the Q and A. So, um, I'm Brody Fox. I'm a professor in the Media Arts and Culture Department here at Occidental. And I, I first off just want to echo Maricela's thanks at the beginning, um, number one for Sky being here, but also um, for all of you tuning in. I know uh, the world is, is in turmoil right now and there's a lot going on and there's so much at stake in this moment. But at the same time, I think um, sort of thinking about expansive um, politically engaged and generative art practice in this moment is exactly where where I need to be and want to be. So I think this is a really uh, great event to have and I'm grateful for it. If people have um, questions that they want to ask to Sky, uh, you should see in the bottom of your screen a little Q&A bubble. And if you click there, put questions into the Q&A and then we'll, we'll fold them in. Um, but um, I teach in a media arts and culture department and, and Shauna uh, is in the music department. And so we'll have the opportunity to kind of start off some questions from each of our kind of disciplinary perspectives um, and then see where things go. And could I, could I be made visible? I just, I think it's this Zoom thing is so weird to just be like <laughs> talking into a vacuum and you can't see any faces. And I- I not able to load, turn your camera on right now? I am, I haven't been allowed to, but I'm now allowed to. Yay! Hi, Sky. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Well, great. Um, Shanna, should I start with a question? Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Great. Well, I mean, in my classes this semester, um, you know, students are contending with the fact that documentary media and ethnographic media, as you sort of have described, kind of come out of some pretty start colonialist and imperialist sort of legacies and have been long based in these really extractive rather than collaborative practices. Um, and also the form of documentary in so many ways has been kind of ri rigid and hidden behind conceits of expertise or authority or some myth of objectivity, um, certain constructs of reality, uh, often getting locked into talking heads and uh, exposition and and explaining as you're sort of saying that you're pushing against uh, and some students are actually grappling right now with the question about whether or not documentary can actually even have an impact in our social and political moment as a form of media so um you know maybe just to start with the creative and formal approaches to to, to mock me because I think some of your approaches are so distinctive um, and are, are such an antidote to some of those traditions that I've been describing. So can you talk a bit about how you how you find find the style for a piece through the camera? Um, I mean I guess like the easy answer, the quick answer is that it just it feels I just 
kind of try to follow my intuition in terms of what I'm shooting. And I think unpacking that a bit, it, it, it goes deeper into, I guess, just the way that I was raised or just the way that I was taught to move through these different worlds and to shoot um, Native people in these different locations, public or not. And um, just that sort of awareness that the camera is something that you can be wary of is, is I don't know, I think it's something that I just grew up with. And I think that really informs just the way that I myself move through these different um, areas or to these different places, um, just being hyper aware of how to be respectful. <laughs> and at the same time, it's just like, how can I then also just shoot things that are interesting to me or not worry about editing too much or what the final form is gonna be, but rather just shoot for the experience of it and for the memories <laughs> and shooting for um, just like the gather material and to see how it all fit together. Um, like with Mothni, like I definitely wanted to try to just see how my short filmmaking practice scaled up into something longer. And so I didn't really want to try and make a new film in a new way or something that I that's entirely out of my wheelhouse. Um, so just like, I don't know, I was like tending to just shoot and I, but I did know that I did not want to do too much uh, visual manipulation in terms of overlays or filters or things like you'd seen in fainting spells just now. Um, but rather, I, I, I felt like I wanted to kind of veer away from that a little bit and to just have there be more straight cuts in the film and to use the soundtrack and to use um, the colors and the saturations of the colors as different sort of ways to um, uh, 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 affect those same sorts of um, uh, impressions that vis digital or visual manipulations tend to do. And I mean, even just like with the conventions of documentary, um, I mean, a conversation that I think a lot about or have been, uh, especially while making films, um, was one that I had with Brett's story where we were talking about um, how the talking head gets a bad rap. Um, and I was just like, yeah, you're right. And I just felt like she was really, um, I don't know, like I really appreciated hearing a documentary filmmaker um, uh, working right now that is just like, yeah, kind of like talking heads. And I was like, you know, I kind of do too. And that really informed how I made um, another short film of mine, um, this Location Blues. And so I knew that I wanted to return to the talking head or use it in a certain sort of way that felt more conversational rather than um, authoritative. authoritative. Um, and it's like, that's I don't know, where I felt comfortable doing like those sorts of interviews with Jordan, where it kind of is framed like a talking head or like an interview, but it's also just us talking to each other. And I think it's like placement in the film and also like the way that it, it, it appears very, very rarely. I think like once in the beginning and once at the end um, kind of de-emphasizes that as a point of um, trying to get any sort of understanding or, or, or disappointing the expectations that one might have when they see someone right here, you know? Yeah, maybe a quick follow-up on that. Uh, I was gonna jump in for a second on that idea. I mean, it's, I think it is so interesting to think of these interviews in relation to kind of other genres of talking um, head interviews. And you're, I'm curious about sort of the ways that you occupy space in the in the film, right? And you're very sort of, um, how do you say, like quiet in terms of, um, you know, presenting yourself as the asker in these particular scenes, but but in other ways, I feel like your presence is is very there, particularly in the camera work, right? Like you're you're very much, um, you know, per, um, reminding us constantly that this is a first person vision of these spaces that you're talking taking us through. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I. Like the acknowledgement of my place behind the camera is important, um, not to draw, have the viewer draw attention to me, but rather to hold myself accountable in ways that this is something that is being constructed and manipulated, even just like in the editing or even just like what's shown, what's not being shown. And in some ways it's just, um, I don't know, like I, I do think that I function as a guide, I think more so in this film because I do the voiceover um, but also as a way that, I don't know, you can see the beginning and ends of clips, the heads and the tails of them and the errata and just these sort of errors that are errors of, of, of the images that show to like, either me finding a frame or moving away from a frame after I'm done shooting. And like, I always like those things. I mean, even just like technically, just like liking like to, to cut on movements. Um, and I think it helps me transition between certain shots or different moves or different tones 
ways that we have easily these different spaces and help bridge those these sorts of bridges. Um, so it's like, I mean, yeah, I, I never want to be the focus of, of um, the, the the attention that I'm bringing to myself, but rather just to be held, held, held accountable in a way that, I don't know, um, gives the viewer a certain sense that this is very subjective and I'm not trying to be objective and I'm not trying to tell any sort of truth other than the one that I think is relevant to the film itself. And um, I think that that also allows me to have deeper relationships with the people that are in front of the camera as well, because um, it becomes about our friendships in these different ways. And I do like to think of the film as a documentation of where um, my friendship exists with Jordan and Sweetwater, you know, like Sweetwater wanted to take me to these different waterfalls and these places that meant something to her. And Jordan, you know, he brought me along in the canoe journey and, you know, hanging out with his family. And it's just, you know, these, these are, these are the places where friendship exists. And I think that the, my presence behind the camera or acknowledging it helps illustrate those relationships and those friendships through the film. Thank you. Yeah, to follow up on that, I mean, um, you were talking about the, the talking head and, and getting possibly getting a bad rap and things. I mean, I so appreciate how in, in all of your encounters with Jordan and with Sweetwater, um, even though we may not see you, um, there is a real kind of participatory and reciprocal kind of conversation that's occurring. And then throughout the piece, the, the cinematography and the camera really, it does feel like um, that you are present and that the camera in a way is a proxy to, to your eye and your way of thinking. Um, I think about sort of two examples that are really powerful to me. Um, like when you navigate through the dance ceremony event where Jordan's performing that the new beginning song with the troupe and it's a single long take that takes six and a half minutes. Or when you and Jordan go to the woods near the waterfall and you each take a personal moment and, and you intentionally adjust the focus, like you make the image blurred and you do this kind of 360 ro rotation four times that goes on for close to two minutes. Uh, and then match cut that as you were mentioning to, to, to another pan that's going in the same direction. I mean those seem like such unexpected choices to me and yet so absolutely right and communicative in those moments. I'm curious, maybe taking one of those scenes, can you give us a little insight into your process of approaching it? You know, or are those decisions you made in the moment with a particular intent in mind or did you find meaning in them in the editing room? Yeah, like, I mean, I guess the, 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 the last sequence with Jordan and I walk into the forest um, I had the camera running for like 20 minutes, 25 minutes as we were walking um, from where we parked the car down to this trail, down to this waterfall um, that he wanted to show me. And I had this gimbal, so I was just like maneuvering it and I just had a camera running and it was just like, I don't know, my arm was killing me by the very end. Um, and it was just like a way to then just kind of start thinking about how I want to shoot this different sequence. Um, the, the, the Us walking through the forest, it's peppered throughout the film, but it comes from a 25 minute long take. And through that, I started to play around with the focus more, or just like, as I'm following him, you know, it's kind of bored. So I just like start thinking about having the background in focus and him out of focus and like just practicing my rack and just none of these different things. And I started to like the, having the background in focus and him in the foreground out of focus. Um, as a small gesture towards, I think just, I don't know, some sort of like integration or acknowledgement of nature or the environment itself. And when we got to the waterfall, like, I mean, I, I, I didn't know he was going to take that time for himself, but when he started to, like, I knew that like, you know, he was doing it because like he trusts me. And I also knew that this is something that's very private to him and I don't want to film it. Um, and I started thinking about the focusing and then I just, um, I don't know, it's like it turns and I pulled everything out of focus and <laughs> kept on turning until he was done. And I don't know, just I, I like the way you put it that it's like both of us having our moments separately put together. And it's something that's, I don't know, it, it comes that had come about through the process of making the film and while shooting. And I mean, like nothing is really staged. Is anything staged? Nothing staged. So it's just like being agile with the camera and trying to think on my feet and to just take whatever the result was, whether it seemed like it was a failure in the moment and see how it could be utilized um, in the film. And like in the dance sequence with the long take, I knew I wanted to do a long take and there's about four or five different 
songs that I recorded. Um, and th the one that's in the film is the one that I like the best, except for this one moment where I turn and I turn back <laughs> and I face the wall and I turn back to the crowd. And that just drives me crazy for so long. I was trying to find ways to edit it out, but ultimately I was just like, no, I mean, like, I was turning to look and see if the dancers had gone onto the dance floor and they hadn't and they were backed up. So I just went back to filming the, the drummers. And I don't know, I've, I've grown to like it more and more and to accept it in terms of its imperfection because it's also, again, like a, a, a marker or a remembrance of this time and this space and just, I don't know, looking, looking around and wandering. I think I'd like to jump in with a, um, another question, if, if that's okay. And I, I don't know if this is one of my students, the participants' names don't come up, up in the list, so I can't tell who's my students, who's Brody's students, and who's from outside. But um, anyway, um, so I'm, I'm visiting you from Suquamish territory up here in Washington, and many of my students are near Occidental and have been part of on Tongva territory, but also really um, fanned out across um, the country and we were studying historical moments of social protest through music and understanding that really widely so we sort of begin by thinking about um you know decolonialism and and survivance as modes of social protest and i'm i just yeah i i love the soundtrack in this film and you've made i think some choices um with the way that you film music and, and musical events that really sort of um, kind of move away from some of the stereotypical ways that Hollywood has tried to, you know, capture, archive, um, and Ginger's musicality. But um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, the choice that you made. So the first two times that drums appear in the film, um, it's very filtered, right? You, you almost don't hear the drumming and it's, it's almost as though you're hearing the whole event from underwater right as though there's this kind of communication happening um you know either to the drummers uh from the drummers to the other world or from the other world to the drummers and then the third time when when we now hear the drums the impact is i think that much greater because we've heard them in this filtered way can you talk a little bit about that choice yeah i mean like i definitely feel um yeah it's like um I was, was going to show a clip from another film, but in it I have dancers at a pow that are, that um, I was filming, and I didn't want to include like either them, legibly because like they're my friends, and I felt like it's protective, and also the music. I feel like when like a non-native audience encounters like powwows on screen, then they just focus on the spectacle of it, um, and they don't pay attention. It just becomes this kind of giant wash that's. Um, I don't know, it's just like, I think it's easier, not easier to dismiss, but it's harder to appreciate the nuance. And so by removing the soundtrack from that section in that film, I just, I wanted to focus on the dancers and the movements. And in similar sort of ways, that's what I wanted to do with the usage of, of sounds and drummers in this sort of sequence as well, or this film, is to look at the, the, the details of the drum, look at, I don't know, the details of the jackets or just like, you know, the, the close-ups that are there and, I mean, to kind of feel the music, but not necessarily be distracted by it, which it, I, mean, I don't mean that disrespectfully to the singers, but I mean, it's just like, how can you then like parse out where your attention is going or where an audience's attention going and give them a sense of, of I don't know, looking at them how to appreciate it in a certain way. And I mean, also too, just um, kind of like replicating this sort of a sense of memory um, where, I don't know, sometimes I wonder like how to replicate memory in film and it is just like certain sometimes the fuzziness of music or it's the soundtrack where it's like you can't quite hear you can't quite remember how it sounded and that also guides the way that i color correct too or i like to color correct to the way that i remember it which means that it's more vivid in real life or it's more vivid in the film than maybe it was on the camera or the day that i shot it and just kind of leaning into that and thinking about memory as a space that also has a bit of magic to it um mm -hmm. so yeah, i guess like those are the things i was thinking about with that Thank you. So we have a, a question in, in the chat. So somebody's asking, first of all, saying they really love the sound design in, in, in Makni. And they felt at the time they were under, at times they were underwater looking at the images. It reminded them of 
being in the womb as well, which was nice as there was the theme of birth and death that they got out of the piece. Um, they wanted to hear about your process with, with sound design. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I've always like wanted to do more with sound design in some of my other shorts. And with this one, while not going to more visual abstractions, it gave me more of an excuse to then focus on the sound to drive to create that same sort of effect and to not burden the images so much with an abstracted space. Um, and also like when I shoot, like I'll shoot with the, the sound and I'll use the sound that comes from my microphone with the onboard microphones, but then also do separate field recordings and just like walk around with the microphone. And like with um, the canoe journey shoot, uh, my friend Drew was with me running sounds. And so, I mean, when I was shooting, I would just like say like, yeah, go walk, walk around and record some sounds. And um, I'm never like really too concerned with sync or like sync sounds. Um, and so, I don't know, I like to move different spaces around a little bit and to layer things up. I think one of the common things that I do with this is I'll take a mono track. I'll take three different mono tracks and then just like um, separate them to the left and center and the right channel um, just to create more, create more of an immersive space. And even just like playing with the reverb or just with the equalization, um, just trying to find ways to have them still be legible and still be identifiable in certain ways, but then also abstracted in such a sense that um, it takes you to a different space other than what the, um, what the image is offering. And it becomes more complementary to the image or complicates the image in, in ways that um, allow me to think about like, you know, life and death and just the sort of like barriers between these different planes of existence without saying it, you know? I was so taken by um, the ways in which in your initial presentation, you were talking about and recruiting ideas of story and myth. Um, my students and I have just been reading um, in a way like a, a scholarly manifesto um, that came out about a year ago by a group of scholars and makers um, called Beyond Story. Um, I, I can put the, the link into the, into the chat, but um, it really emerged out of a group of documentary scholars and makers who are pushing it back against the way in which story is being um, sort of co-opted and defined and almost becoming tyrannical in certain types of, of mainstream documentary where even sort of the common application um, for grants from the International Documentary Association starts with what's your story, who are your characters, um, and there being a real sense from commissioning producers that, that a documentary um, needs to have some sort of person on a hero's journey that goes through almost kind of like the, the beats and plot points of a, of a Hollywood fiction film, and there needs to be drama and tension and all these sorts of things. And so you're already sort of suggesting or speaking to kind of reclaiming or reinterpreting notions of story and myth in your own ways. So I'm wondering if you can talk a bit more about that and particularly about making space for that in, in work that makes documentary claims. Yeah, I mean, like, the big reason why I make the films that I do is because no one wants to fund them, you know, like I'm really bad at writing these proposals and it always like, I don't know, kind of ruffled my feathers to think of my friends as characters, you know, or just like it felt like you have to be medical to the idea of documentary. Um, and I mean, so like, I guess like a lot of the ways that I started making films was just out of necessity or just because I had a camera and a microphone or a set up or a camera and a microphone and had it with me when I was going to these different places or thinking these different things. And um, I think that sort of like financial freedom um, really kind of informs the, pro the process as well, where I mean, like these films are made on no budget, you know, like Mofni was made for $25,000 and primarily that came out of like my own pocket and um, just like support that I get for like grants, like for artist grants. And um, for a feature length film, I guess that's not a lot of money, but for a regular guy it is, you know, <laughs> and it's just, um, it, it, I also like, I, I like embrace that sort of freedom as well because I can make a film like this and I can, offer these different suggestions around what films like this could be or what nonfiction or what documentary or what these different genres could look like outside of the prescribed notions that we're often working within, especially when it comes to organizations that funds documentaries or narrative films and how there's certain expectations that follow a very Western model of storytelling. 
And like with this film, I mean, like Sweetwater and Jordan, like they never meet. And I never thought that they should meet. <laughs> and I still don't think they've met. Um, but it just became about, like, you know, processing what it means to move through these different spaces and even to try and understand like my own identity and my own place within this world and as well as in relationship to them and not fall into these sorts of, I don't know, traps or expectations of like these binaries, you know, like, I mean, um, like Sweetwater, she had, um, I think it was probably four months after I started shooting with her that she told me that she was pregnant and was concerned about being involved in the film. And I was like, it's okay. You know, it's like, this is part of it. And, you know, it just did not became part of the film. And, you know, I just didn't want really was wary about trying to present the film as well as like a binary between like a man and a woman, a cis man and a cis woman, or to essentialize Sweetwater's experience of as being a cis woman as being pregnant, because it's like not my place to tell that story. And it's not one that I wanted to put her in that position of being the vector for that storytelling. And so, it, I mean, just like focusing on our conversations and the places that she wanted to take me and the places that she wanted to take me and that were important for her and um, her unborn child at the time um, was important. And how can like this film not try to do everything, but still also touch all these facets of our friendship and um, what it means to be indigenous in 2017, 18, 19, 20, whenever, um, and still be a place to ask questions. And like, I mean, I guess one of the things to think about with like indigenous documentary or films or art is that a lot of it I think it should be asking questions of like, what can these forms look like? Um, and I don't know. I think the, the, it's just, I think of all of my films as, as propositions and questions about what indigenous art can look like and what indigenous form can look like, not as answers, you know? Like, I mean, I think the dialogue that happens and the things that I miss and the, the ways that the films are imperfect are starters for conversations about what the future holds and what that looks like. So we've got a couple more questions in in the Q and A chat. So um, somebody's saying, can you expand on how to participate in relationships that transcend time? Um, do you specifically mean in film or stories? Do you remember what that's referring to? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think I said something. Um, what did I say? What was I thinking? Like, yeah, like, I mean, I think I was like talking about um, Wilson and Henry and these recordings that, they, that I have of them. I mean, that's something that I, I've, I think about with a number of my films as well, like just the relationships that one has with the media or these archival materials. Like I made this film about my father and these recordings that he made over the course of 10 years or that I asked him to make or, or recorded of him and how I felt closer to those recordings than to him. And it felt safer to be closer to, to them than to him and it functions as a proxy or as an approximation of a relationship. And in similar and unsimilar ways, like with the recordings of Wilson and Henry, I felt like I was participating in the friendship, you know, like listening to them laugh and laughing along with them and understanding their friendship in a different sort of way. And it didn't feel like this was a conversation that was happening 35 years ago, but it felt like a conversation that was happening right now in the moment and has a certain presence to it. I mean, even like when I look at the film now, I mean, actually I watched Mothney for the first time in like nine months, um, just last week, which is strange, <laughs> but even like, just like watching it, it took me back to these different moments or yeah, even just like, you know, checking in with Sweetwater or Jordan every now and then, you know, just thinking about our friendship and how the film is an archival object now or an archival documentation of those relationships, but also, um, there's something more because of where they take you or they have the possibility to take you. And even like how that also informs the editing structure of the film where I'm not necessarily concerned in chronology. Um, a lot of things happen out of order in the film. I mean, it's not that obvious or I don't know if it's obvious or not, but um, I'm just like not, it's not, it's not that I'm, it's not a concern of mine. Um, like there's a moment where Sweetwater is talking about um, this time that we went to a waterfall and she's referring to it in the past tense, but that was the time that last time we went to go shoot, but that appears at the end of the film. And so it's just like small little things like that, that's kind of like don't ascribe to any sort of order, but also the, they don't concern themselves with order or time or chronology. And I think that that's, I don't know, 
that feels more true in some ways and I don't know how or I don't know why. We got a couple of other great questions. Um, so Eduardo lives in the chat is asking, can you talk about the scene where there's the myth of spirits visiting our world a long time ago? What was the process like of making that particular scene? Do you know which scene that is? Um, I think it's might be the one that was on the beach. Eduardo, if you want to clarify which scene, you can always pop that in the in the Q and A chat too. Oh, uh, I think there or there's like a sequ sequence around Tomato as the um, the meteor. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about Tomato. Um, so that's a meteor that is at the Museum of Natural History in New York City, and the meteor. Um, was is an important object thing to the people of that region in Oregon Grand Rounds and it was stolen and taken across the country and they won't give it back but they have an agreement with the tribe that the tribe can like come every year and like perform their ceremonies and um, they'll also um, support uh, interns from the tribe but still it's just this really like old meteorites that existed for eons um, and has an important place in the cosmology of this community, of, the, of this tribe, of these beliefs, but still it's just so far away. And I mean, like when I first heard about Tamanolis, that's the name of the meteorite, um, I, I don't know, like I just feel like it had a place in this film. And so when I went to go, go to the museum and shoot, so I just, I don't know, I just tried to, I don't know, shoot it in a way that, I mean, isn't really that interesting, but it felt like a bit vernacular, I suppose, in terms of how I use the camera. Um, and I don't know, even just like that sequence too, I just wanted to um, give, actually, I don't often talk about Tamanos enough, but for me, like Tamanos was the third character between Jordan and Sweetwater or well, alongside Jordan and Sweetwater. I guess fourth, if I'm if I'm counting myself as a character in the film as well. Um, but it's still like a, um, it's, it's another point that I think builds this different constellation of, of I guess, like time and life in the spirit world. And I know these different sort of planes that are inhabited by people or not, whether it's at a museum or it's along the shore of an ocean. Hmm. So someone else is asking what advice you'd give to upcoming indigenous filmmakers, producers and artists specifically uh, working within colonial institutions? I mean, like make it what you want to make, like really. I mean, you'd be surprised how little permission you need to make the films that you want to make. Or you need to find out who you need to get permission from, and it's often not white people. You know, it's, it's, it's whether it's like your community or it's whether your elders, like that's the permission that you need, not from, I don't know, someone that wants to give you money or doesn't want to give you money and makes you work for it. I definitely think just like follow your instincts and really foster those because I talked a little about instincts earlier just in terms of like an instinctual approach to filmmaking, but it's just like, you know, instinct is like a culmination of a lifetime of experiences and a lifetime of um, internalized teachings. And I think that's important to remember. And, you know, like the idea that you have isn't crazy. It's, you know, it's probably coming from a place that is truer to yourself than something that follows a more traditional format. Not that there's anything wrong with those films or making those films, but I'm saying just like, you know, definitely trust your teachings in guiding you towards um, realizing the things that you want to make. And maybe it is something that follows a more traditional form of documentary or narrative, or maybe it's something that's like weirder and more experimental. But I don't know. I think, yeah, follow your indigeneity and um, question the, 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 the gatekeepers. Could, would, should we touch bases about the In Plain Sight project? That's yeah. that's something you participated in. How how tell us about that a little bit and what message you chose to share? Yeah, I mean, it was a really beautiful project. And when Ralph and Castles reached out to me, I was just like really honored to be a part of it. And I just felt it was like really important. I mean, the like I don't know, just like the. <laughs> This artificial border, this manufactured border between the United States and every country south of it is just 
so arbitrary and also just like really creates a sense of, um, I don't know, othering family, othering kin, you know, like often an anti-immigration um, platform is actually anti-indigenous, you know? And I think that's something that a lot of people like forget about or don't realize. And it's just like, I mean, how can we also like not, how can we unlearn the othering that we have been taught to other family, to other kin, to other relatives, and to, I don't know, just be kind to each other. And the message that I chose was, it's not your fault. Um, I don't know, I just like, sometimes it's a really good thing to hear for someone to tell you. And sometimes you, someone just like really needs to hear like, you know, it's not your fault. And I don't know that, 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 that was actually the first thing that I thought of. And then I just try to think of some other things, you know, that, that I could write or that would be typed um, in the sky. And I just kept on coming back to it and it just felt right. And that's what I decided to go with. Thank you. So I think probably a lot of the Oxy um, students and, and, and faculty have a good sense of in plain sight because of the, uh, the fact that Occidental is an academic partner, but just for really quick context for people who may be on the, watching the, the YouTube live stream, um, you know, in plain sight is this national coalition of artists and activists. And on July 4th um, of last summer, um, the organizers chartered a fleet of sky riding planes to transmit artist messages in the sky over ICE detention centers, former government incarceration camps, border patrol station and immigration courts across the United States to call attention to, you know, these horrifying practices occurring not only historically, but obviously today in plain sight and to offer solidarity with, with individuals who are currently detained. So, um, so that's, that's the, uh, the context that this guy's talking about with that message. I mean, you're also a participating artist in um, the Oxy Arts um, show, We Live Memories of Resistance, which is um, actually up in the uh, Oxy Arts space on York Boulevard, though, um, obviously because of the, um, the pandemic and things, um, it's, it's not something that can necessarily be physically visited. There actually is a 3D virtual tour that people can, um, can sort of take of the exhibition um, itself. Can you, um, I know that you have got a piece in, in that. Um, can you tell us which piece that is and a little bit about that? Yeah, we have a two channel installation um, called Cloudless Blue Egress of Summer. And that's a film that I made while I was in St. Augustine, Florida. Um, I didn't know this until I went there, but um, St. Augustine is the site of Fort Marion, um, which is, it's like a 300 year old fort built by the Spanish and is consistently on the wrong side of history. Even now, maybe, I don't know. Um, you know, it's not true, there are very nice people there. Um, but it, at, the, um, at the end of the Indian Wars, it was a place where they brought prisoners of war from the plains, um, travel members. And it was where Richard Pratt developed the, the, what became the, the boarding school system for indigenous people in this country. Uh, it's where he coined the, coined the phrase or, or said the words, you know, it's to um, want to kill the Indian and save the man. You know, it was in this building, it was in this fort. And I didn't know that. Um, I was just more familiar with like the, I guess like more established like boarding schools like Carlisle or Haskell or Sherman. Um, uh, so just, it was surreal to come to this place and to um, see this fort and to learn about the history. And it was also a place where um, prisoners were housed during the Seminole Wars in the mid 1850s. Um, so on each channel I have, on the left channel there's, um, Primarily, it's like, a, it's like a survey of the fort or just like the camera moving through the fort and text that Kawakache wrote about his escape from the fort in the 1850s. And on the right channel primarily are these, uh, these, these drawings, ledger arts that the prisoners made in the 1890s. Um, it was like the rejects because um, Pratt would also take these drawings that the prisoners would draw and sell them. And so there are a lot of collections around the country but the things that they wanted to buy were like the more um, uh, uh, like like horses, planes, buffalo, like the sort of stereotypical expectation of, of 
uh, um, Plains Indians. And the ones that they had still at the San Augustine Historical Society, like in this banker box in their basement, um, was about, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 drawings that had a little bit of damage, but were also like of scenes when they went to the circus. So um, they would draw like, you know, clowns or horses or acrobats. And there's like these sketches and incomplete drawings. And I think that they're really beautiful. And um, so the right channel is just like me moving through these different drawings as the camera is pointed at them. So it may be in too nascent a stage to, to want to talk about it, but I know um, people are often curious to know, um, particularly given the, the challenges of, of COVID and, and things like that. We were chatting right before this started that um, it's extraordinary you're a Guggenheim fellow this year and, and you were saying that the project that you initially planned to work on there has been sort of shifted a bit because of the moment we're in, but, but what, are you, what are you at work on now? Where, where is your mind and your art taking you at the moment? Uh, I mean, my mind is mush right now, um, but I'm still working. I mean, I'm gonna try and see how this project turns out. It's about powwows and power culture. It's, it's part of like how I grew up and like my dad was a drummer and my mom was a dancer and I grew up going to powwows as a kid and it's something that I just really wanted to return to and make a film about. So that's, that'll be my next feature length film. Hopefully we can start shooting the summer, knock on wood. Hopefully the, the world writes itself. Um, if not the summer after that, but it's something that I will be working on for some time. Um, I recently had an exhibition open at the Hess, at the Bard CCS, the Hessel Museum. Um, and in that I have a new series of photographs and a new three channel installation um, that I finished or mostly finished as of like three weeks ago. So I'm kind of like in a little bit of a break right now or as much as a break as one can be in this moment and also while teaching, but yeah, I'm just like, um, I think at a point of kind of taking a little bit of time off. Um, I've been on like a pretty, I don't know, it's, I've been averaging like two films a year for the last seven years. So I'm just kind of exhausted and <laughs> wanna kind of see what else there is to do. There's a lot going on in the world right now, you know, to be exhausted about, <laughs> I do think. Um, so when you were um, talking about the time that you um, spent um, preparing the project that's now in Oxy Arts, I was thinking a little bit about, you know, this other historical reality, which is the like disproportionate ways that pandemics have affected, have affected indigenous communities. And I know that this current pandemic is having a different kind of resonance for, you know, and effect on indigenous communities. So, so the original question I wanted to ask you was just about you know, how, how that has affected you, how that has affected the communities that you're working in. But then in the meantime, you, you're you talking about this new project. So I'm wondering if you're hanging out on social distance powwow at all, and that's at all like been part of the like, survivance you're finding at this particular moment. Yeah, I mean, I've, I mean, I'm, I think I'm in that, I mean, I'm in social distance powwow, but I haven't been watching it recently. I think I got burnt out on media halfway through the summer and I'm thinking about deleting my Facebook and Instagram every single day just to kind of get a break from it. And I mean, like, I really appreciate that that happens. And I think that also speaks to the resiliencies of powers and how complicated they are in a lot of ways. I mean, they can happen anywhere, you know, and like further proof that they can happen anywhere and they can adapt and change and shift. And I mean, I think they get a bad rap in a lot of ways and deservedly so, but I think they're also beautiful insights for a lot of um, a lot of survival and a lot of resistance and a lot of survivance. And I think it's like what I'm interested in with, with this project. And I mean, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Like it's, it's been a long, hard summer. <laughs> and, um, I think I'm still processing that. And I don't know, I think like with the, I made a series of photos that I took with medium format camera like 16 photos and in that I etched texts around the borders and around the, the image itself um, with, with like a little Dremel um, after I print them. And the text that I wrote was just things that I had written in June. And I mean, it's just like with everything that was going on in June, it just, you know, it was an outlet and it was a way to help process and to think about indigeneity and also just the erasure of indigenous people um, continually, you know, and yeah, just kind of trying to sort it all out and who knows when it'll all be sorted. I don't think anytime soon. 
Thank you. Well, maybe one one last question um, is, you know, I'm really taken by your agility and ability to move across a range of mediums and to have a really kind of multimedia and multidisciplinary practice. Um, I mean, in the liberal arts here, I think often we encounter students who are struggling because they're, they think there seems to be a, a tendency or propensity to professionalize and discern yourself as being one type of artist or one type of maker. Um, but you know, you're writing, you're doing photography, you're doing a wide range of different sort of um, media forms. Um, you're circulating in having work that's distributed through, through film channels and festivals, but also have gallery representation. Can you give some advice about um, either creatively, how do, you, how do you pick the form for your next project? Um, and, or also how do you create space in a practice to, to be allowed to be many things, to be, have a plurality? I think it's, I mean, started by being not very good at a lot of things. Like I wanted to be a musician for a long time. And, you know, it's, that's how I learned how to edit was by recording myself playing multiple instruments on Pro Tools and piecing it together. And then I was an English major, but I ultimately got a degree in liberal arts at Portland State University. Um, and I wanted to be a writer, but I just never thought I was good enough for it. Um, and um, it wasn't until I started, I, I found film that really combined a lot of these different passions of mine. And that included like just very amateur photography, like with a point and shoot camera, with music, with editing. And through becoming more comfortable with my filmmaking practice, that allowed me to revisit these other passions of mine, including writing, including photography, and even music to some extent. Um, and just kind of starting to see like how these can all speak together in different ways, or just like feeling like whatever is the right sort of outlet or medium for whatever this thought is, or even just seeing how um, pieces of writing can translate into films, but then that, that can also translate into photographs and just to try and weave them all together in ways that make whatever sense they make to me um, and not really too concerned with the um, what they look like in their final form, but just kind of following this sort of path of, of, of seeing how these different things can be in communication with one another, or they can offer a different perspective around a similar sort of topic. Um, like the title of the two channel piece, Cloudless Blue Eagles of Summer, it also has a passage of writing that um, is also appears in another film I made called Lore, but then they also appear in a series of photographs that I did. And ultimately, they're, they're, all of their writings appear in um, a book that came out, a little chapbook that came out last month called Perfidia, which is just like, I don't know, it, it's, it spawned out, the, this piece of writing Perfidia spawned off into like photographs three films and this book itself. Um, and it seems convoluted, but it just seems to make sense. I don't know, like if it makes sense and it makes sense. That's great. I don't know how, I don't know how helpful that is. <laughs> well, we've covered an extraordinary amount of ground and it's unbelievable that we're almost up at time. I wanna quick um, promote um, some upcoming events. So um, this, this fantastic event tonight has been part of a larger um, We Live Memories of Resistance exhibition and then the In Plain Sight and OxyArt series this fall. I've dropped a link into chat that gives a listing uh, of all the events that have occurred as well as ones that are upcoming. Uh, an event like this is being recorded so there may actually be opportunity to, um, to explore prior events as well through their recordings. But next week um, on November 10th, um, there's a workshop, a community, part of the community organizing workshop series, um, Alternatives to Police with an organization called CAT 911 or Community Action Teams, uh, which is going to propose different ways to, to address um, sort of community issues rather than just having police respond, um, which obviously is, is a very sort of pressing and important issue right now. Um, and then on November 12th, um, the artist Kentura Davis um, is going to um, be in conversation with another artist, Felipe Baeza, who's also in, um, both artists in the uh, We Live Memories of Resistance show that's in the Oxy Arts Gallery. So hopefully you will all join us again for, for more of these great events in this series. But to really sum up, I just want to personally say this has been a, a real treat um, to, to get to talk to 
to an artist who I admire and I know my students have really responded so so strongly to your work this semester and it's been a touch point for our, two of my classes so thank you so much for spending this time with us thank and at this, at this moment I mean truly truly valiant to <laughs> come out and <laughs> you know be out in the world in this just crazy week <laughs> yeah so thank you and thanks to everybody for joining us yes thank you